Okay, the noon whistle is blowing here in Fort Atkinson, and the computer says 12 p.m. So it's my opportunity to say that this is Steve Larson of the Horge Dairyman staff up here in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, welcoming you. We have a nice bunch of you out there with us today. Uh, lots of interest in this uh, webinar today, how they achieve 40,000 pounds of milk per cow. And I think that that title is actually a little bit out of date. We may hear more about that shortly, but uh, we welcome today our uh, presenters, Tom Castell and, and Steve Woodford. And uh, with those comments, I'll turn the control right over to Mike Hutchins, our co-host down at the University of Illinois to get this thing rolling. Mike, take it away. And uh, before I, before you start, I just want to acknowledge QLF and their support of today's webinar. So Mike, Take it away. Uh, very good, Steve. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, both of our speakers today. Uh, Tom Castell will have a more, actually, he'll get more formally introduced. He's the owner operator, as you can see, of Evergreen View Farms, and he has more details here coming in just a few minutes. His uh, co presenter today will be Dr. Steve uh, Woodford. Uh, Steve grew up in Minnesota. We don't hold that against him too much, at least, and got his degrees from, uh, uh, from Minnesota. And then he saw the light and came to the University of Illinois, where he got his master's and PhD degree. Degree, and he currently has worked with nutrition professionals uh, up there in Wisconsin, and they are a group of eight consultants there, and they serve primarily, uh, he serves primarily eastern Wisconsin. So with that, we are going to go ahead and move on, and Tom, well, we'll let you uh, take, take control of the program. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, uh, my name is Tom Castell, like Mike said, and uh, I'm married to my wife, uh, Jen, for 44, almost 45 years now. And um, we've been farming together since um, 73. I've been a lifelong farmer, um, except when I went to college. And um, I started farming uh, when my dad passed away at nine. And that sounds a little ridiculous, but it's really the truth. I've done all the mating on the farm since then and the milking for many, many years. And um, so I've been around this business for, you know, 60 years already. And um, we do have my son farming with us now. And um, it's a great addition to have somebody else in the family. And um, we formed an LLC to give um, uh, continuity to the farm in the future. And uh, so far it's working out fine and <coughs> we'll just see how it works in the future. We, we plan on it working just fine. Um, we milk around 90 head all the time. We raise everything on the farm. We raise all the bulls, all the heifers. Um, milk is about, every year is a little different from 30 to 40% of the income. The rest is from selling um, embryos, genetics. And uh, the picture that's up on the screen right now is um, how the farm was when we purchased it. <clears throat> Only it looked a lot worse. It wasn't that pretty in, as it is in the picture. Um, it was abandoned. A guy left the cows in the barn and everything and just took off and went to California. So we've done a lot of fixing, a lot of uh, additions, a lot of silo building, a lot of barn building, and um, we've added more land over the years. And um, it's it's been a very good farm for me. And we added the, the homestead in 1979, and my son lives there. poll here so here's your chance to uh, to poll uh, here's we're gonna have uh, five five choices which one notice that word one factor is most important in achieving high milk yield has nothing to do with today's program yet it will be later on in the program but we're simply asking you listeners if you asking for higher milk yields what's most important one genetics two overall management three forage quality four housing facilities environment and four fifth, reproduction and fertility. So the polls are now open and uh, we're off and running. Steve, what do you think? Well, you know, I'm looking for all of the above, but I don't see it there. And I've had a little bit of uh, familiarity with um, uh, that evergreen story um, in the past. So um, overall management might be my first choice, but genetics would be um, both of uh, crops and livestock, but uh, I've had a little bit of a hint, you might say. So let's see what the folks out in the 
countryside are saying there. Well, Steve, well, we are voting pretty yeah, fast voting yeah. today, so. Go ahead. Yeah, we got two thirds of the votes in. That's close enough for government work. So uh, we're going to share that with uh, the people. They can take a look at that. And uh, it's up there. And uh, we can see that overall management got two thirds of the vote. Uh, second was forge quality, 9% genetic, 6% housing, 8% reproduction and fertility. So uh, that's kind of interesting. And I, I guess as we listen here today, we're going to be able to uh, determine how that changes. So back to you, Tom. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your operation. Okay. Our cows are housed in a in a tie stall barn. Um, most of it was built in the, um, 1903. Um, I have a model of the original barn in my basement, uh, how it was built. And um, it's been updated, tunnel ventilation's been added, long day lighting's been added, tiled mangers, uh, comfort stalls, water beds. Um, so besides the outside walls, um, the barn has you know, been completely updated to modern standards and uh you know if i could just um make a little comment about your poll there um a few weeks ago i got a forage magazine and dan undersander was um writing the article and he said he's worked at the university of wisconsin for 30 years and in that time um forage uh um quality has been the main reason why milk production has doubled in um, Wisconsin and in the United States. And I'm sure if you walked into the genetic department there, they'd be spinning around on their chairs. And if you walked over to the um, environmental section for the cows, those guys would be spinning in their chairs. So it's, a, it's clearly a combination of all of those things. Um, if you went down to um, the, uh, um, 500 race down in Indianapolis in spring and you had uh, 70s technology, I don't care how good your driver was, you're going to get beat. If you put poor, poor fuel in the cars, I don't care how good the car was, you're going to get beat. And if your uh, um, pit crew were the Keystone cops, you're going to get beat again. So it's a combination of all those things. And um, so overall management and um, it certainly rises to the top very quickly. But when you start getting into extreme production, then the genetics takes goes past uh, everything else, in my opinion. And uh, But you know, our goal here, and Steve can verify this, is we, it's not to have a high rolling herd average or to produce a lot of milk per cow. It's to give our cows the best chance to do as well as they can and let the results um, speak for themselves. We don't talk about rolling herd averages. We don't talk about milk per cow. We just talk about how are the cows doing? Are they doing as well as we think they should be? And that's true. I, I guess uh, we'll get to the diets here in a little bit, but yeah, I, I can't remember if Tom's ever said to me, hey, I'm at this many pounds of milk and I want to get to this on the next ration. That just doesn't come up. The cows are going to do what they're going to do and we just, hopefully the ration support that. So, yep. You want me to, okay. We, um, a few years back, quite a few years back in 2001, we decided to go with greenhouse barns and uh, we really liked the light airy um, appeal to them. Um, they can get cold in the winter. Um, in the stretch here, um, our, our greenhouse barn with the water beds in it was challenged a little bit. Um, I ran the scrapers this morning. Uh, you know, it gets pretty cold in these barns. We might, they're all naturally ventilated with open ends, um, with breathable fabric on them. But um, at any rate, everything, all the dry cows, all the pregnant heifers are all housed in these type of barns from baby calves on up. And um, it's amazing the environment in these um, barns uh, compared to some other housing. And as far as labor goes, uh, we have a, a good staff of people. You're always looking for that one extra guy, but we've had a lot of our employees have been here 10 plus years and um, they're very dedicated. Um, they probably do some things better than I would do them myself. And um, so we're very pleased to have them and very thankful for them. Um, we do cross train everybody. Everybody should be able to do everything else on the farm. But of course, like anything else, some are better at some things than others. And they take the lead on that, on those things. Um, 
with stress very um uh, years ago i heard doug maddox talk and he said if you're going to farm you have to farm like you have one calf one heifer and one cow and if you can take care of every animal like that you're never too big and uh, i've always took that to heart you know you farm with groups of animals but every animal is an individual. And if you don't notice the individuals in the group, you're going to be in trouble in a hurry. Okay. Um, the rolling herd average right now is like 44,600 pounds uh, on any given day. I, it's a little higher than that now because this last test day, we averaged 151 pounds of milk and uh, with right at a 4% fat. Um, the feed this year has been great for producing butter fat and milk and um so uh it's a it's a good year to be milking cows except for the price so this would be his <clears throat> i guess this would be the december dhi sheet summary sheet yeah. so it'd be the average um a lot of those numbers would be the average up to that point but the current fats and proteins are running higher than that. and he said the current milk production is higher than that too and it's true. It seems like this fall, the corn silages are making more fat tests. Kind of, I'm seeing that all over. And Tom's cows are also demonstrating that. So, milk urea nitrogen, we don't like it real high. It tends to run, if we see it in the 9 to 10 zone, we're happy. Um, if it gets a lot higher than that, we're going to make some ration adjustments. So, and then the rolling herd and those numbers were off the test sheet. So, these would be off the test sheet. Um, on Wisconsin, um, they break it down by first, second, and then third plus lactations, and those are the averages you can see. The only thing I would make a comment, and maybe Tom can comment more, is on that first lactation, you see the average age is 26.2 months, but that's a fairly small sample size of 42, and you know he'll flush some, and so the range may be up and down from there, but that's pretty typical, I think, of what he sees. Um. Yeah, our two-year-olds, uh, I, I guess our um, our two-year-olds peak in that 135 to 140 pound, but they hold it really well for a long time. And that's what really um, extended lactations uh, where, you know, the mid-lactation on these two-year-olds, they're milking averaging 161 pounds. We had some two-year-olds over 170 pounds last month. and um, uh, we had like uh, 10 cows over 200 last year, last month. And um, some of these were fresh a long time and still milking right at 200 pounds. So our, I guess our goal is is to keep cows milking at a high level for a long time. So if you look at these day intervals, those are, those are the day intervals reported on Wisconsin DHI sheets. So that's why they seem kind of uh, well, why it would be 0 to 100, 100 to 240, and then 240 above. That's just the way they reported on Wisconsin DHI. And as you can see, Tom mentioned those second lactation animals. I mean, their milk production is virtually flat the entire time. It's really pretty remarkable. Um, they just don't drop off. So, well, I'll talk a little bit about the feeding. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Mike said, I've worked with, well, actually, I've worked with Tom now. This will be uh, yeah, this will be the 30th year. We started working together in 1987, the first year I got out of grad school. So it's been a long, long journey with Tom, and it's been just a fantastic, you know, just you, you get to try stuff with the rations and see how these cows respond. So, um, you know, I guess I would say I get a lot of clients that ask me, you know, you must be doing something different at Tom's ration to get that kind of milk. And all I tell them is we really aren't. The diets are pretty basic. You know, they're they're alfalfa. He really, again, Tom grows all his own forage, so they're alfalfa haylage, corn silage. And I went back just to refresh my memory, and if you, uh, I looked through two years of his forage samples, and we virtually never feed anything over 200 feed value and almost never under 150. As you remember from the slide, he's got six silos, so we can pick and choose. But Tom does not go out and make the really low fiber, high relative feed value feed. I don't particularly like feeding that stuff. Don't think it necessarily feeds real healthy. So. We have just good alfalfa, corn silage. He's fed BMR for a long time. He also grows some non-BMR, but the BMR is the focus for the milking group. High moisture corn stored in a harvester. It's rolled on the way out, not ground. And I might make the comment that if you walked in the barn and looked at it, you might think it looks coarse. It's not ground fine. He doesn't tend to make it really wet. Um, 
and that probably helps with the fat test and just cow health. The last two years, Tom went to a high chop BMR corn salad, and we'll show some slides of that later. He's cutting it quite high, and it's tested extremely high quality. You, know, you can see the numbers there. It's low 30s NDF, oh, usually over 40 starch, and the NDF D30 is um, you know, upper 60s. I think the lab average at the lab we use is something like 54, so it's quite high. You know, the diets typically run 60 to 70 percent forage. Before, when we were before he fed the high chop BMR, we were getting dry matter intakes in the 60, 64 pound range. The last two years, when he went to the high chop, and it was obvious, we picked up at least two, maybe three pounds of dry matter intake. Every now and then, we will have to feed some um, non BMR to the cows, and when we do, we lose a little bit of intake. So they really respond to that high end DFD that's in the the high chop BMR. Um, you know, and he's getting more than two pounds of milk, um, obviously, per pound of intake. So the efficiency on the herd is is extremely good. And we're not feeding a lot of high moisture corn right now. It's only about eight to 10 pounds. And it's because I think the diet right now is about 55, 58% corn silage. Um, as I mentioned, these are not out of the normal diets, in my personal opinion. We don't tend to feed high protein. I don't believe in it generally, and we don't do it here. 16%, I've run them as low as mid-15s at times. Kind of depends what the cows are telling me on where we can set it. You can see the NDFs, and, and, and these are also not high-fat diets. You might expect a lot of fat to be fed with that kind of milk, but we don't tend to do it. Again, it's based on his corn, his haylage, and his corn silage, and usually we're feeding about 55 to 60% corn silage. This is the diet that he was feeding a month ago, and you'll notice there are two silages there, BMR and non-BMR. Um, right now, we are back on all BMR. Um, there are times of the year because of the timing of harvest and the silos that were, there are times that we feed um, some of it. So right now, um, the diet is close to 70% forage. It's, there's less corn being fed than this diet shows currently because we're on all BMR. Um, you can see the numbers as they go down. Again, it's something like 57% corn silage and it goes down. I might mention the baleage and those roasted soybeans you see listed. Those are top dressed. So those are top dressed in the barn, roasted beans, three pounds a day, and then the baleage, and that's pre-processed in the bale, and then he top dresses it. And he's done that, I think, for as long as I can remember. Um, just seems to work really well in this system. TMR, again, nothing um, I think would look out of the ordinary here. 16% protein, the fiber levels, you know, we're not running them really low, although some, the NDF might be a little, but the, the one thing about this high chop BMR is the, the ratio to NDF to ADF is a little bit tighter than maybe what you'd see in some forages. Um, just to clarify, just one little point, Steve. Uh, I went out and measured the stubble, and we were aiming for 35, 36 inches, and the stubble left after chopping was uh, what I was getting was 36 to 37 inches. It doesn't look that hot, long when you see the pictures of it, but that's what it measures. Yeah, it's, it is it is really high, and we'll show some analysis here a bit of just those individual forages and what what that does for the quality. You can see the starch content, we're always below 30% starch. Um, he does feed some uh, a sugar product, so there's some sugar there, and again, the fat percent of the diet is about five, and that's total fat not added. Uh, nothing, um, again, real noteworthy here. Um, we don't add potassium sources to get the real high potassium, just haven't thought I needed to spend the money to do it here. And all the rest of the numbers look, I think, pretty standard, so, okay. This is the protein mix. Um, and I'll just maybe some, you, those are the main ingredients. We didn't list all the, the small things, but um, if you combine the roasted beans that you see there, there is some of the protein and there's some fed separate. He's feeding about four and a half pounds or two kilograms of roasted beans a day per cow. The cotton seed is about 1.8 as fed 0.72 kilograms. And then the energy booster is about a half a pound or 0.2 kilograms. So if you add up the roasted beans and the cotton, and the energy was to, again, these are not high fat diets, especially when you look at a 66 pound dry meter intake. Um, I don't think we need to do more. Cows aren't saying we need to do more. And we've kind of just held it there. Um, obviously, if we, there have been times we fed more, but usually we're in this zone. Okay. You know, the additive stuff, I, I don't know. Again, nothing's, again, magical here. Yeast, he feeds Remensen. Um, we do feed. Uh, a chelated chromium product and organic selenium. The trace minerals, the standard trace minerals, however, are not organic. We just haven't done it. 
Um, biotin's been fed for hoof health, some bicarb. You'll notice beta carotene, which probably wouldn't look typical to a lot of people. Um, I brought it up to Tom a number of years ago because there was data out there that uh, embryos have a high content of beta carotene. And obviously, as Tom mentioned before, the bulk of his income is embryos. So we've been putting, it's not a cheap additive, but um, Tom feels comfortable or confident that we've gotten better embryo quality. And so we've done it for quite a few years. Um, again, I think it's the only herd that I do it on. But again, he's, you know, with the embryo income, that's important, I think, to maximize that. We always check for mycotoxin um, at least maybe twice a year. I'll do a TMR test, just scan the TMR. And if we have a toxin problem, we do feed a binder. Um, and we currently have a binder in right now. So again, um, not a real long list of additives. Um, looks fairly standard, I think. Okay. So reproduction. Um, we don't follow uh, a lot of um, standard voluntary waiting period and things like that for obvious reasons. Um, uh, we got cows milking, you know, over 200 pounds a day early in their lactation, even in mid-lactation. So we'll back off on the um, voluntary waiting period. I don't, it's not even in my head very much. I don't think about it. I think about the cows. Um, we do not have a lot of difficulty um, getting cows pregnant when we want to. Uh, there are always a few cows. Um, we had her checked this morning and um, there was one out of, I think, 10 or 12 that we checked that was not pregnant between the cows and the heifers. So <clears throat> we do run longer lactations and um, cows don't flush well um, in the beginning of the lactation when they're milking extremely well, especially, um, you just never know which ones will flush. Uh, some cows will flush at 40 days and flush quite well and others won't flush until 200 days. So, it's it's always a consideration. It's it's part of our income, so we have to think about it. And um, we do have some cows that um, we will resort to putting uh, embryos in um, for necessity reasons. And we do use maybe a third of the herd to carry embryos um, because of higher genetics and. Um, the whole herd is fairly high, but there's always some higher ones. These are some of our better cows we've had over the years. Of, I think some of you people recognize some of these animals. The top one is uh, my gold. That's the second one down is a picture of um, her also. And she was the production leader up until a couple months ago. And now she's been beat by another Wisconsin cow, which I think is great. I think records are made to be broken. and. Uh, it's her mother in the middle there, and she was the record holder for about seven years. And um, so now she's the third high record holder. And from the same cow family, the white bull there is Snowman. He's been used around the world, especially as a sire of sons. And um, I think uh, we do currently have the number one milk bull in the world. He's a super sire son. He's 3,400 of milk. He does have a proof. and. Um, I think three of the top six milk bulls in the breed trace back to our farm, either through Snowman or through other bulls on our farm. This, of course, is the stat statistics. And um, I was reading something uh, uh, this weekend that somebody did a study on the rumen flora and the rumen uh, balances and how that affects production. Um, this cow um, is a low component cow. I don't think that's genetics at all, and I don't think that's what she's going to tr transmit. I think it's from her rumen flora, and uh, um, she doesn't like to make um, high butter fat, and um, but she makes a tremendous amount of milk. This is her dam, um, which is maybe the greatest all-around cow, um, certainly that's ever lived. Um, she's one of the best production cows. She transmits great she never been done before that a cow <clears throat> was the world record holder had her record broke by her own daughter so um just a tremendous cow and we still get inquiries around the world about her this is just a profile of what um you know they're asking how 
our animals compare to other animals in the breed. And this is breed average. There are people who have higher protein on their heifers and higher fat and higher milk, but the averages are way, way below. Um, 300% higher on the heifers, uh, well, looks like 300% on fat and um, five, 600% on the milk. So we, we try and use good genetics. We try and use the best bulls that are balanced bulls that all produce milk, have great udders, and yet um, have really good components because components are getting more important all the time. We simply don't cull cows <clears throat> for milk production. Um, it's never been a much of a problem of mine, but our cows seem to all milk. Um, we sell a lot of animals to other farms and uh, they'll come back and uh, tell me that, you know, they had two-year-olds milking over 160 pounds a day on their farm. And uh, I ran into a guy this summer who told me a cow I had sold him was screwing up his whole parlor routine because she was milking over twice as much as the other cows. So the cows we sell milk and um, and are of good type cows. We never sell a bad type cow to anybody, but we try and maintain a core of cows throughout the year. Um, we sell cows early in lactation. So if anything, they have a negative effect on our herd average because they haven't reached peak milk production yet. And uh, But selling cows is a major part of our income. This is uh, off the DHI test sheet. It's the, um, Net merit of uh, the sires of the uh, different lactations. And as you see, the two year olds is 567, 497, and then 311, where the breed average is $68. I think that there's a lot of room for improvement on people's breeding programs. And uh, I'm sure there's herds that are higher than I am, but on the average, there's a lot of room for improvement. Go ahead. Um, we make all our own forage. Um, uh, this picture was actually taken by Howard Derriman a couple of years ago on a uh, different story. But um, uh, we we cut with three hay binds and uh, two of them are conventional sickle mowers. And um, I happen to be cutting on this field here when they came by. Um, we did an experiment this summer with a 30 foot hay bind uh, with the wings. And um, we did, um, it was 10 points drier than the haylage cut with this hay bind. So it's something we are thinking about looking at a way to quicker get our hay dry. And the sugar content on it was higher than um, the hay cut with our hay bind simply because it dried quicker. We are very, very fussy about our alfalfa how we plant it, when we plant it. Um, um, and uh, this particular field, which we, we took out of production this fall, is um, won the Ford Super Bowl contest twice down in Madison. And uh, uh, it's on sloping ground on the, the homestead on the other farm. And it's dairy land, um, I'll say that because it is. And uh, that's what DSL, D, it's dairy land. Uh, hybrid alfalfa, and it's been very good for not only producing, but also for um, staying in production year after year. Well, I'll just comment on this because I see the, well, obviously Tom's feed samples, but I see them too. And, and I guess I would say that, you know, the one thing that stands out about the diets here is the, the, the consistency of the forage and the palatability. You know, I we just have amazingly consistent feed, and that's all due to Tom. He's got the six silos and baleage, so we can pick and choose. If we happen to hit one that we don't quite like, we can allocate, which is great. I think the third point is is big. I don't, it's my personal opinion. I'm just not a big fan of these really high relative feed value, low fiber alfalfas. I just don't think they milk as well as you would expect. I don't think they feed as healthy as you'd like. And so, I, I you know, that we're not over that, I like. And part of it is Tom's desire not to want to feed straw to do that. You know, you hear people feeding these these high quality forage diets and adding straw. At least in Wisconsin, it wasn't so bad this year, but the previous two years we had a lot of 
vomitoxin in the, in the wheat, there was a lot of contamination in wheat straw and it's an issue. And I think by not bringing that into the diet, you just avoid a potential issue. Um, and so I really like the forage quality and how it, they fit together. Um, you know, Tom basically, I don't know how he does it, but he basically avoids rain on the forage. Where it, it just almost never happens. He's got enough hay binds for the size of the operation. He can make hay quick. Um, I'll maybe let Tom address this. I know we've talked about the low lignin alfalfa. I, you know, there's, I, I think there's a thinking out in the industry is, you know, how low, how much, how, how much fiber can you feed or how much forage can you feed that's low lignin? If you have BMR that's high chopped and low lignin alfalfa, is there a point where you don't have enough effective fiber? I don't know. It seems to me if you feed more forage, even if it's all low lignin, I think it'll work. And it's worked here with this. I would think we would get another pop. And again, Tom might come in whether he's thinking of trying low lignin, but in the future. We're going to put in a plot next year. Um, I, I've noticed um, just from my observation, I talked to some friends of mine who had planted a lot of low lignant um, alfalfa. Um, they had trouble establishing it and keeping it established, that they got a lot of winter kill on it. Might have been just their farm, might have been just a bad year. but. Uh, um talk about an advertisement my dairy lane guy just drove in but anyhow um we're going to try and experiment with it i've got a field uh, picked out or part of a field we're going to run them side by side and um see what the yield differences are um see what the lignant differences are cut at the same time uh, i don't need to have this wider window like they say you have with um, um, conventional conventional because we harvest in a hurry. <laughs> and so it's not a big concern for me, but I think it's something we'll look at in the future. This, this is just his last tailored sample. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say, I would say it's typical of what we put in. I, as an example before, you know, you can see the numbers there. I think this stuff feeds great. You know, it's got good quality without being so low in fiber. And I would, you know, again, this is the last sample, but, I would consider it really typical of um, of, of what we run in his milking diets. This is the first crop alfalfa cut um, in the end of May, um, probably about the 27th of May. And um, in our area, you get up close to 22% protein with these end of hay, um, end of May first cuttings, and that's about as good as you're going to do. Um, the relative feed quality of 187. I think is about where we target to get to. Um, I don't want to see it over 200. Um, the cows just don't seem to be as healthy on it. So this is kind of what we're targeting for. So this is this is the uh, the BMR corn silage, and this would be the high chopped BMR corn silage. Again, it's the last sample that I had that we're using. You can see the numbers. I mean, it almost is halfway between what a typical corn silage would be and what snaplage would be. Um, you know, fairly high starch. You know, the NDFD 30 hours is 63. The lab average for the lab we use is 54. So it's a full 10 points above lab average. Just outstanding feed. Um, it's it, it amazes me that this stuff feeds, when I say high energy, I was going to say hot, but it's high energy, but it doesn't feed like it's too hot. We don't have issues with off-looking manure. The cows are healthy. I mean, it feeds, it just it just really works well. It's um kind of an amazing feed. I I've when he first did it, I was a bit skeptical that I was going to be able to, you know, hold the ration fibers up and get the grain right. But it seems to milk and feed really well. Um, absolutely love it. So on the next slide, I believe there's a picture of what it looks like. And it's a little hard to tell straight ahead, but on the left side, you can kind of see the last row chop where the where the um, stubble, how high it might be. Um, kind of gives you an idea of what they're trying to do with this high chop BMR corn silage. I drove out just about in that exact spot and measured the stock height, the stubble height that's left in the field now. And um, they are um, 36, 37 inches. Um, so that was about hitting our goal when we're driving down these fields, we're driving on top the corn stalks. But like Steve said, if you look to the far left of the slide, You'll see how tall it is. Uh, the chopper operator commented to me that it was pulling wires off from the bottom of his chopper. And uh, this is a 109-day BMR corn silage. And uh, 
It's coming off at 61 Point eight percent moisture, high cut. Yeah, I think Tom did it for his own curiosity, but he went out after he had chopped that corn, high chop, and then chopped off the stubble that was left. So this isn't this isn't whole plant corn stalks. It's the stubble after he chopped the corn silage off high. And you just to show what am I leaving and why does my high chop corn silage test the way it does? Well, this is what we're leaving. And you can see the numbers. Really high fiber. You know, obviously, um, um, it doesn't, you know, this stuff really doesn't add anything to a milking cow diet. It's just a bunch of indigestible fiber. Um, and, and that's why we're leaving it. Even if you look at the protein, I mean, it's extremely low. Um, and um, it, it just kind of gives you an idea of why we're getting the silage we're getting. Um, yeah, and a little bit further comment on that. To me, of all the things I'm doing on the farm right now, this is one of the things that's... Um, almost a no-brainer for me. If I'm, we raise all our own shell corn, we we raise all our own feed basically, our soybeans and everything. So if we, um, if I'm combining in a field, right next to this field and I'm leaving all the stalks, why wouldn't I leave some of the stalks in the field I'm chopping in and then go back and harvest some of those stalks in the other field, the better parts of those stalks for heifer feed. And um, that's what we've been doing. And the next slide will show you somewhat how we do that. Uh, we take our heifers and um, we mix corn stalks on top of haylage or peas and oats. And uh, right here, you'll see it. This is a field of peas and oats that was cut, let wilt to about 50% moisture. And then we go and take a, a shredder and we shred these corn stalks a year later. They've been stored now for a year. And we'll shred them right on top of those windrows and then chop them. And it makes a great mixed feed that uh, they eat all of the corn stalks. Um, it provides fiber for them and um, allows me to feed them really good haylage, but with the fiber added. Okay, as far as our milking system, we... Uh, we, we milk with an around the barn pipeline. Uh, we use six units, three on a side, three on each slope, and two people milk. Um, we milk seven in the morning, 3.30 in the afternoon, and 10 o'clock at night. Um, they aren't exactly eight hours, but we have, uh, we have to contend with, with uh, employees what's convenient for them. And um, they do most of the milking nowadays. I'm approaching 70 very quickly here. So uh, there's plenty of other things to do. We use, a, we've been milking three times a day for 40 years. The cows are prepped with a portable around the barn future cow tit scrubber. It works quite well. We were broke down for a milking and I almost had a panic here, but uh, going back to washing the tits off conventionally. We don't have a lot of metabolic disorders, but um, anybody would be uh, very amiss if they didn't say they had some. We do give calcium boluses to all fresh cows um, past their first calving. And uh, third plus lactation cows, we give them a bottle of lutinate under the skin. And um, this seems to alleviate just about all problems uh, we have, but there are times, and, and we discussed this with the veterinary this morning during herd check, we do run blood samples if we're not happy the way a cow is performing. And after 60 years of doing this, I got a pretty good idea um, what the cow is lacking. But uh, we do verify things with blood tests, and um, uh, we, we've we never lost a cow long as I've been farming with milk fever. So um, we watch things pretty close. The calves are vaccinated with um, a rota corona and an E. coli scours um, vaccine when they're born. Um, and uh, it seems to be quite effective. We are going to be changing the rota corona one to a different product that's just come out. Um, the next calves that are born will be treated with that. We do uh, a vaccination program according to the vets. Um, and as far as mastitis goes, uh, 
Uh, our normal milk that we're shipping is between 80 and 100 cell count. Um, when we test or if we suspect something in the middle, between tests, we will uh, CMT paddle them, evaluate what they have, and then treat accordingly. Um, any cows not returning to normal, as I would expect, we um, they have an, a new test called the PCR test offered by DHA, and I think it's a really great tool in determining what um, we isolate from the milk, what is causing the mastitis. Well, it's time to give these guys a break, Steve, and it's time to vote again, but now, but now, here we go. Which one <laughs> factor um, listed, we saw these five before, as you heard Tom and Steve talk, and probably more emphasis on Tom, which is the most important in achieving high milk yield? So again, uh, we're going to go to these five, and uh, Steve, uh, after listening, listening, what, uh, where, where do you, because Tom's going to vote on this. Tom, uh, Tom, uh, you're going to have to vote on this. Where, where are you at, uh, Steve? What do you think about this, Steve Larson? Well, I think uh, he's stressing genetics, both of the cattle and the uh, uh, forages, that good management can only take you so far. And when you get up to certain levels, it's got to be in the, it's got to be in them uh, to make it work. But, uh, well, let's see now how the, how the folks are voting it. I think uh, there's a little shifting in the voting from before, but not, not, not a whole lot. That's so, right. Mike, uh, we're about two-thirds voted yep. now. Yep. Let's uh, go ahead and close the polls. At this point, you must have Republicans voting because they're not changing their mind. Tom, you can see those numbers again. Uh, Steve points out 12% on genetics, 55% overall management. We had one person say, well, overall management is like all of the above. Hopefully, you didn't do it for that reason. Uh, a third of you said forage quality. I think it picked up some there. And, of course, the other two lost votes there. Tom, uh, what would your vote be if you were forced to vote on only one of those th uh, five items? Well, if I was, uh, to, the higher you go on the ladder of production, like I said when I started out, if you're um, talking, you know, we just had another cow make 70,000 pounds of milk, and that's our, I think our fifth cow over 70,000 pounds of milk. On that, on those type of cows, it's genetics. There's just no question about it. But if you don't give them the feed and you don't give them the housing and the, and the ventilation and all those things, um, you're never going to uh, achieve that type of production. So you got to have the genetics. And uh, if you don't have the genetics in your feed and in your cows, you are not going to reach those high levels. You, when you're breeding cows, you are breeding them, you know, and you get what you breed for. Okay. Um, over time, you get what you breed for. If you breed for short cows, you that's what you achieve. If you breed for tall, um, very extremely dairy cows, that's what you get. If you breed for cows with high butterfat, that's what you get. But you have to realize what you have. You can't feed a, a herd of cows that is bred for low milk production with high components and think you're going to get high milk production with moderate components. That doesn't work. You have to feed the cows for how they are bred. And I truly believe that. And uh, um, it's just like if you plant bad alfalfa and bad corn and think you splash on the fertilizer, you're going to achieve what a great hybrid will achieve. It's not going to happen. So it's a balance of the things. But genetics becomes more and more important the higher you climb up the production scale. So. Here you have up a slide, the future of Evergreen View. Um, we've uh, always operated under the philosophy that uh, it's what you produce per unit of um, on the farm. And uh, so, you know, I know there's lots of farms who say, we just got to milk more cows to, to make a living. And in many cases, that's simply not true. It's tying up all the loose ends on the farm um, not letting the profits leak away on this and leak away on that. If, if there was anything I learned from high school FFA class or egg class, it was that know what your cows are as individuals. And back then they would say test them, which our farm has been doing since 1917. My grandfather was testing already back then and get rid of the cows that are unprofitable. On most farms, there is 
a very profitable group of cows as the base. And then you move up to the next group that's maybe breaking even per year. And then you move up to the group of cows that is losing money. And if you have 20% of your cows losing money, you go all the way through your breaking even group of cows and you still haven't made any money. And then they start stealing from the profitable cows. So don't milk, don't have those unprofitable individuals, don't have those unprofitable acres of land, don't have the, you don't want to subsidize the losers by the winners. And uh, you can milk a lot less cows and flood the market a lot less by just milking truly profitable cows. You know, this is a slide of some of our visitors from around the world, and we've had thousands over the years. And um, at one time, we had every top bull in the bull studs in um, um, China. That's changed somewhat since other people um, have really pushed into the market. But when I talked to the individuals over there, they said, you might not have the highest genomics, but your cows from your bulls always milk the most. And that's really what our goal is, is that um, that's been our focus, is to have our cows milk for ourselves and for other people and around the world. And um, um, right now, uh, you know, I really take it as a, Oh, almost as an honor that we can help improve the um, dairy industry in other parts of the world. We've worked extensively in China, extensively in Russia, and now we're going to be going over to Abu Dhabi the 1st of February to look over their dairy industry. Well, Steve, I think uh, we've gone through our program here. We'll turn the program back to you, Steve Larson, to uh, start okay. uh, before we go to the questions. All right. Very good. Thank you, Mike. And thank you very much, uh, Steve and Tom, for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and a very popular one. We've had the largest uh, uh, live audience uh, of any of our webinars that we've had in the past. That's a real compliment to you and the subject uh, uh, at hand. We want to thank uh, QLF for their support uh, uh, sponsorship of today's webinar. Always want to thank uh, and acknowledge Mike Hutchins and his partner, Jim Baltz, down at the University of Illinois. And reminding those of you that are with us uh, that you'll be receiving a, a survey here in a couple of days. We ask for your input on that. To, uh, it just takes a few seconds. And also, always, uh, uh, you can make any suggestions or comments about our webinar series by emailing webinars at hordes.com. So, uh, we welcome any input you have now looking ahead. The next uh, webinar, uh, Nina Tietholz, uh, talking about animal facts, separating fact from fiction. fiction. That proves to be very interesting and uh, quite a uh, spin on uh, all the diet heart controversy uh, over the years, over the decades, frankly. And then looking uh, further ahead, Jack Britt, uh, well-known uh, dairy analyst, I guess you might say, talking about what dairy might look like 50 years from now. Our webinar on March 12th that will be sponsored by D. Laval. And with those comments, uh, Mike, uh, have you got some questions for these guys? Boy, Steve, do we have questions. So uh, Tom and Steve, get ready to strap her on. Here we go. Uh, we got them coming from a lot of different areas and around the world here. Uh, one question, Tom, is a neat one. That is, do you strive to look at a certain combination of young and old cows? Uh, his comment is, as cows get older, they give more milk, uh, more extended. We have to get more older cows in, in, in the milking herd. What, what's your philosophy on your age distribution? Do you target something in your herd? No, we really don't. But I just noticed on the DHI summary sheet that we have one of the older herds um, in, in our area for cows. And yes, cows do give more milk when they get older. Our young cows, of course, uh, the um, mature equivalent on our two-year-olds is higher than in any other group of cows. It's at 48,000 pounds of milk right now. So we can, um, we're not afraid to milk two-year-olds because, um, but like I say, we maintain somewhat of a core of cows. We do have also dry donor cows that have been very successful as a milking cow. And then we kind of retire them to making embryos. But I'm not afraid to milk two-year-olds because um, my two-year-olds average 130 plus of milk. 
at peak lactation and average way over 40,000 ml. Another question, to us, Tom, do you have written protocols or standard operating procedures for animal care for like uh, at the calving, the pre wean calves, the transition cows, or is that pretty much handled by you and your son? Um, we do have um, written protocols for calving. Um, what, you know, especially with the calves, but with the cows also. Um, but we're in constant communication with everybody that works here. Um, you know, I work with them on a daily basis. We, we discuss cows. Again, cows to me are individuals. Um, doesn't matter what a group's doing. It only matters what the individuals in that group do. And we do make changes from time to time uh, on how things like we're going to change this vaccine on the calves for the road of Corona because I don't think we're getting um, effective stuff on that. So we're going to make some changes on that. And you have to evaluate what's happening and make changes. Tom, I think you may have answered these next two questions, but we'll ask them again. Uh, days in milk at, uh, are a bit long. Is that due to flushing or because you're a breeding program? Uh, I don't think it's infertility. Is it uh, comment on that? No, it's not infertility. Nine out of 10 of our cows that we checked today were pregnant. And so only one of them wasn't, and she happens to be a flush cow. And um, she loves to go cystic, and she was cystic again this morning. But um, it's a choice. We choose not to breed cows back early in lactation. Um, this is a firm belief of mine. Cows get old when you calve them in and when you dry them up. The last three cows that I dried up were milking over 130 pounds of milk, and they were all over 500 days in milk. And this is very, very hard on these cows. And so. Um, my cows keep milking, so I have no um, qualms about breeding them later. W when you go from 50 days to 400 days, cows are just on cruise control, and they don't need to be disturbed by um, early breeding them back and stuff like that. We just don't do it. And Tom, with that comment, another question quickly came in and said, how do you dry up cows giving that high level of milk production? You make them angry. <laughs> you have to disturb their routine. Our cows have a very um, uh, set routine on every day, how they get fed, how they get cared for, how they get milked. And so you radically disturb their routine. We, we chase them out with their bread heifers and uh, in a freestyle barn, they're like I say, in a, st in a stall barn rest of the time. So when we chase them out, that's a pretty radical um, departure from their normal routine. And some of them um, will dry up quite easily and some don't. And uh, But we do dry treat them. Um, if they have any cell count issues at all, we'll dry treat them the day we um, chase them out. And then we will we dry treat them again when we stop milking them completely. Okay, now uh, we're going to switch gears quickly here, and there's some questions that came in ahead of time, and you all, as you know, you can do that, so let's uh, do those, and uh, Steve, you may want to look at these, or and Tom, the first question from Wisconsin is, what is the uh, length of chop of, on, the, on the corn silage and haylage, and are you processing the corn silage? Any comments on that? Well, I'll let Tom answer the first part, and I'll answer the second. Well, the, the length of chop on the corn silage is... Um, uh, 22 millimeters, that's theoretical, you know, and uh, we do process, we've been processing uh, for many years. Um, now we've gone to shredlage. I think there's a slight advantage to it. I don't think it's the end of the world advantage, but I think it, there is a slight advantage. I think we get a little more intake and uh, the, we, that's one thing we do hire done and uh, they do a, a great job of custom uh, processing the corn silage and uh, I'm very well satisfied with their work. Uh, they use a cloth chopper and um, he is, we talked yesterday and he said he's going to um, buy a new chopper this year or trade it off and I hope he can do the same quality work. The cut of haylage is probably in that inch range theoretically. Um, we don't like it real long because we have silo unloaders. So um, it's not in a bunk. I think uh, sometimes we way overrate the length of cut, that longer cut will give you better um, uh, room and uh, function, whatever. Well, I'll give, so I just shook his diet here 
last week just for this. The diet as it was was 10% on the top screen and the three shaker box. It was 10% on the top, um, almost 50 on the middle and 40 on the bottom. I don't, a lot of people get all wound up about what's on the top screen and that's all they care about. And I personally don't. And there's data from Wisconsin that shows that's what, what's on the top two screens is, has a stronger correlation with fat tests than just on the top. The length on that middle screen, they won't sort. Um, so I'm comfortable with the 10% of the top screen. And also remember, he does, Tom does top dress that hay. So if you did the math, if most of that hay, that three pounds of January fed was on the top screen, it would be, then the the total diet would be closer to, you know, 12, 14% on the top. And I, I agree. I too long. They just start sorting it. We don't have those issues. So the uh, okay. next question came up here. Uh, I guess to Steve, they might want to answer both of them. Uh, phosphorus levels. Uh, we saw, I think it was 0.36. If my memory is right. Comments on phosphorus levels that you're targeting in your herds up in the East Northeast Wisconsin. So, you know, we're not supplementing any extra FOS. The FOS that gives you the 0.36 is coming from the forages and the, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm perfectly comfortable having his milking cow diets, you know, in the, in the low 0.3s, 0.3 to 0.35 on, on, on FOS, and that's fine. The, the heifers, the dry cows, especially the heifers, because they're getting those alfalfa-based diets with the, 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 the corn stalks mixed in, because it's alfalfa, they're getting plenty of calcium and FOS, and so we don't supplement. I think on the the second one, um, you don't want a lot of potassium in your dry cow diets, so we don't want to add it. Plus, he's not feeding the molasses to the, the dry cows. That's just to the milking diet. So uh, we're not adding any supplemental potassium to any of those heifer dry cow diets. Okay, let's go back to our uh, a couple lists here, Tom. You can um, um, knock these off quickly. Uh, when you were speaking in Mexico a couple years ago, you mentioned BST. Are you using our BST right now in the herd? We can't use it anymore. Um as of uh, later this year, so we are off of it now. And uh, it's a sore subject for me, but um, uh, that's the way it is right now. Uh, another reader, uh, listener, picked up on the 7% annual cull rate, which would include mastitis, uh, reproduction, and death, and he was surprised at that low number. Any comments why that cull rate is so low when you look at you know national averages sitting in the, in the 30% range? I think the 7%, um, and it was almost exactly the same for the last two years. Um, that might even be an overestimation of what our actual cull rate is. Um, we might be more in that 6% range, but we don't have a lot of um, severe mastitis. Um, like I said, we never cull for milk production because our cows milk enough. And we try and um, do a really good job with foot care. Um, we trim once a month and uh, so we have very little calling for that. But um, we do set merchandise cows to other people, but they've had uh, extremely good luck with our cows. And, uh, and that's kind of a problem. Once I sell them a lot of cows, they aren't calling their cows very much. So then I lose the customer because they don't need more cows. And um, we try and educate our customers who are buying our cows how to take care of the cows too. Another related question, Tom, and that is where do you store the corn stalks and, uh, and uh, the, the, the haylage or, or, or that we saw in the picture? Uh, uh, where, where is it stored and how do you, how do you handle that? Okay, when, when we make these corn stalks, it's kind of like a three-ring circus, uh, and, but it's very well controlled. Um, either I'll be combining or my son will be combining, and we're shredding the stalks almost immediately behind the combine. We do that with a regular standard stock shredder. We then rake them. We try not to rake them uh, in too wide of a windrow um, with the, a V rake. And then they're round baled and immediately wrapped um, in plastic. We're aiming for 50% plus on those stocks and we're able to achieve that most of the time. And then we normally store them next to the hay field that we're going to apply them to next year. So um, they're round baled and then line wrapped. Okay, and it sounds like this they're actually silage. If they're going in fairly wet at this point, uh, the corn stalks that you're wrapping, they're, they're, it's almost like a silage, isn't it? Absolutely. That's what the goal is. Okay, um, then uh, one, one question, are you using any synchronization program in terms of reproduction? Are you using um, shots? No, no, we're, no, we're not. 
Okay. Uh, you already talked that one question came on RBST. You already covered that. What about robots? Your your herd size that you could be a robotic farm. Did you ever think of going to robots uh, or in the future? Yes, we have thought about it. I've I've looked at a lot of robot farms. Um, with the number of times I would want to milk my cows, I would get down to maybe at the most fifty, maybe forty eight cows per robot. It gets pretty expensive, and robots are changing a lot. I was over in Europe probably 15 years ago when the very first robots were going in. I stayed with the guy who um, was installing them and uh, servicing them. Um, we've got a fair number of robots in our area. They still are to this point fairly high maintenance, but some it's it's um it's very dependent on the owner of the robots and the herd of cows. We would build a new facility if we were going to do it. Um, Let's see what this price of milk does. Uh, you know, I've always been um, a pay-as-you-go guy. And if it doesn't pencil out very well, we're just going to wait and see. $20 milk works a lot better than $13 and $14 milk. A question for you, Steve, and that has to do with uh, uh, amino acids. Uh, our understanding is you're not adding a supplemental lysine, methionine, or choline uh, to this herd. Is, is that a correct statement? I'm not. I'm not adding lysine or choline at the current time. We it wasn't. We didn't list all the little stuff on that list, but there is a small amount of methionine being added. Mm-hmm. And I've, you know, Tom and I just had the conversation last time I was here about you know this price of milk. You know, a lot of these things are on the table. You know, and you know we we may take some of that out and just see if we get a response. If we don't get a change in milk protein, um, but I, we do have a small amount of it in. Okay. So. Very good. Uh, what about fresh cows? Uh, they're in the stanchion barn. Do you give them something different, Tom and Steve, to the fresh cows in the stanchion barn? Um, when the cows first calve, and you know, a lot of people have trouble with their transition cows. Either we've been lucky over the years, or I'm not sure what it is. We do not have a lot of issues with fresh cows, but we do um, separate them off on the end of the barn. They get milked last because they're fresh cows, and we're using them milk in a pasteurizer to feed the calves. Um, We do give them long stemmed grass hay um, that's cut kind of the middle of the window. It's not the real, real young cut and it's not the old cut. So that they eat a lot of it. And um, uh, we did have a a few incidents of DAs here. One was a repeat DA, um, but we didn't have a DA for like 14 years for a while. But now we've had three of them and one was a repeat and the others were on two young two-year-olds that um, just happened that they had floating DAs. We fixed them, they're doing great, but we don't normally have DA problems. What we do like to supplement this long grassy hay to them to keep their bellies full. We don't have a specific pre and post fresh diet, it's just the milk and diet, so. Okay. And it's a one group TMR. One group TMR. So do you take that grass hay and a top dress that to the fresh cows then? Yes, we do. Okay, very good. Well, listen, uh, you guys get a yeoman's job here, and our apologies. We probably have another 20 questions here, but it's after 1 o'clock, and the contract says we wind up. So, Steve, we'll turn the program back to you. Steve Larson. Okay. Thanks again very much, Tom Cassell, Steve Woodward. Woodford. Wonderful job, lots of interest, uh, uh, a great webinar, and again, thanks to QLF for their sponsorship. Uh, having uh, all of you look ahead to February 12th, our next webinar on uh, the diet heart controversy, animal fats, and so forth. And then looking ahead to March 12th, D. Laval will be sponsoring Jack Britt on Daring 50 Years From Now. Thanks for all of you uh, being with us, and we look forward to having you join us again.